Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm just I'm curious here. Um, what countries people are from? Like, raise your hand if you're from Germany. Okay, how about Scandinavia? Um, Netherlands? Southern Europe? Anywhere Southern Europe? A few. Um, and North America? Alright. Um, yeah, so they asked me to um, provide a quote for the uh, program, the Liminal Village program. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. And I chose one from the 1960s entertainer, Sun Ra. He was a very flamboyant guy. And um, he said, we've tried everything possible and none of it's worked. Therefore, we must try the impossible. And uh, that really resonated with me because I don't know about you guys, but from time to time I get into these um, periods of despair where I look around the world and the problems are just so huge that even if we as a species turned all of our energy to, to healing the situation, even then it might not quite be enough. But we're not even turning all our energy to healing those. In fact, we're continuing to turn the planet into money and destroy everything that's beautiful. Um, and so I get these moments of despair, you know, and, and it can look pretty impossible. On the other hand, I also sometimes have the privilege of witnessing the impossible. Uh, seeing things happen that I can only describe as miracles. For example, I was at this healing center recently where the woman working on me, uh, who had been going there for a few years, she had had a complete thyroidectomy, which means they, they took out her thyroid gland completely because of cancer. And she was told she had to be on synthetic thyroid hormone the rest of her life and if she stopped taking it she would die and then she had a dream where she was told to, to stop taking the medicine and so she listened to that dream and stopped taking it and she didn't die and in fact she kept getting better and better uh, and then finally she went and got a blood test and it tested positive for thyroid hormone which is something impossible basically she regrew her thyroid gland and so I, I run into various miracles in, in, of healing, healing of various sorts. It could be you know, bodily healing or it could be environmental healing. You know, it's just a Tamara, which is you know, driving there. Uh, it's in uh, northern Portugal, you know. And driving there, uh, it looked like the land is turning into a desert. There's just, everything's brown everywhere, parched. And, and dusty, you know? And then you get to Tamara and there's green everywhere and there's these little lakes and things. Uh, and they're actually healing the land and healing the desert through permaculture techniques and water retention techniques. Um, and then there are miracles of, of peace happening. I um, have become involved with um, some people working in Africa and there's this guy, uh, you know, you look at the, at the, the bankers or the, the people in charge of this world, and a lot of people say, a lot of people say this to me, they say, Charles, they're never gonna change. The only way to change them is through force. And because they're basically completely wedded to the power system and they're on top and they're getting all the benefits and they're never going to change. So we have to, don't be naive and talk about a revolution of love, Charles. These people don't understand love. You can't just sit there loving them and hoping they're going to change, which is actually an unfair characterization of um, what I'm saying. I'm not talking about just sitting there and loving people um, because actions do arise from a state of love. but. They're never going to change, right? Uh, you can only change them by force, and that's a recipe for despair because they have a lot more force than we do, don't they? 
So there's this guy, General Leopard, in Liberia. He was a warlord during the terrible civil war there. The kind of guy who would recruit child soldiers, brutalize them, and turn them into killing machines. He was a man, by his own description, a man with no conscience. And then the war ended, and he was out of a job. And he said, the only thing I knew was killing. So he was out of a job, so he decided to go to Sierra Leone, where there was a civil war, and he could find a job again, and apply his skills as a warlord and, and killer. And on his way there, his car breaks down. His car gets stuck in the mud, actually. And at the same moment, another car gets stuck in the mud right next to his. And this car is full of uh, some people from a group called the Everyday Gandhis. They're peace workers in Africa. And they begin talking and he says, yeah, um, I was a warlord and now I'm trying to find, I'm going to Sierra Leone to fight there. And he expected them to, to hate him, to beat him maybe. He was afraid they would beat him. But instead they told him that they loved him and they hugged him. And he decided that he would give up killing and devote the rest of his life to peace. And I think it's an important story because if General Leopard could do that, then everybody could do that. And that includes all of us too. Because just like he was, we are stuck in a world that turns us into killers whether we like it or not, or whether we realize it or not. Hey, Jen, how do you put back the channel? A lot of happy people over there. Oh, you only have one channel. So, yeah, but it's not saying. It, it sounds all like it's of that from there. was oh. about um, this kind yes. of these two different states that I that I go state of despair and hopelessness, uh, and then um, another state that feels actually more real and more true, that recognizes that the despair is coming from a place that's obsolete. It's coming from an understanding of the world that's obsolete that doesn't take into account these things that we can call miracles. Uh, and what is a miracle anyway? <clears throat> a miracle is something that is impossible from an old set of beliefs, but possible from a new set of beliefs. So if we were Stone Age hunter-gatherers and we found uh, a refrigerator, that would be a miracle because such a thing could not exist within our story of the world. I'm going to call it a story of the world. It couldn't exist, you know? Uh, but, but for us, it's not a miracle because we have a story, a system of beliefs that, in which that thing is totally normal. But it's not normal um, to experience some of these other things. And in order to have a livable planet, um, we're going to have to do these things that are not normal today. So I've become interested in what I would call the technology of miracle, which includes a lot. It includes material technologies, um, healing technologies, social technologies, using technology in a really broad sense, technologies of forgiveness, of nonviolent communication, of holding space, of human energetics, <clears throat> technologies of water, technologies of earth. And to understand these better, I've been thinking and speaking and writing a lot about what is the transition that we're going through? What is this old story of the world, this old set of beliefs at its root? And what is the new? And I think that we can feel that we're in this transition, that all of the crises that we face today for example, the money crisis, but all the crises, uh, the, the ecological crisis, the water crisis, the energy crisis, the political crisis, healthcare, everything, education, everything. We know that these aren't like little problems that we can kind of fix them and go back to normal, right? We sense that, that the crisis goes all the way to the bottom 
nothing will change unless everything changes. And what is this everything and what is this all the way to the bottom mean? I think what it is, is what's changing fundamentally is our basic answers to the most important questions human beings can ask. <clears throat> For example, who are you? Like, what is it to be human? What is it to exist? What is important? What's valuable? And as a species, who are we? Why are we here on Earth? Where do we come from? Where are we going? Every culture has different answers to these questions. And I call these answers the story of the self and the story of the people. So our culture says, you know, I write about economics sometimes, like my recent book is about economics, and then I give talks about economics, and then I start talking about the story of the self, and then I have to justify it. But actually, the money system is built on our story of the self. We're going through a transition to a new story, which is why the money system is becoming obsolete. It's why it's falling apart, and it's why it's no longer aligned with who we are. And that's why the things that you really want to do in your life, there's not much money in those. And the things that you don't care about, that's where the money is. Or the things that are repellent to you, that's where the money is. Why should it be that way? Well, that's another topic, and I might get to that later. But right now, I'm just going to tell you how I see our civilization's story of the self. So it says, here's what you are. You are a discrete, separate individual among other separate individuals in a world that is separate from you. Um, so, every, and every, every field agrees about this definition up until recently. So psychology said, yeah, you're this mind encased in flesh uh, and there's other minds out there or you're this consciousness Philosophy would say, you're this, this little speck of consciousness looking out through the eyes of a flesh robot. A flesh robot. Biology says the same thing. And it says the flesh robot is programmed by your genes to maximize reproductive self-interest. Religion says the same thing. Not esoteric religion, but generally speaking, religion says, yeah, you're this soul encased in flesh. Physics, same thing, separate self, external universe, and you interact with that universe through force, force, which again is a recipe for despair because it says that your effect on the universe is only due to the amount of force you can exert, which isn't very much. And no matter how hard you try, what about those millions of people who don't get it? who drive their big cars and throw away plastic and don't understand about the environment. Like, what about them? You're not them, you can't change them. So anyway, um, the separate self has been with us for a very long time. And <clears throat> I think that, that we can all feel that it's becoming obsolete and that we're transitioning to a different story of ourselves, of what it is to be, a different answer to the question, who are you? And you know what it is. And at a place like this, sometimes you can feel it. You can experience um, that you are not separate, but that everybody around you is somehow the same being looking out through different eyes. And that the planet is not separate from ourselves either. But everything happening in the world is happening inside of us, too. And have you ever had that moment of clarity where this wasn't an intellectual theory, but it was a felt experience? Actually, it's always a felt experience 
because, well, because, I mean, why do you think it hurts to even exist today most of the time? It hurts to exist because of what we're doing in the world. Um, and the interior reflection of the pain of the world is painful, which is why we get bored so easily. Boredom being the feeling of discomfort when there's nothing to do, nothing to take you away from yourself. And I, you know, have you ever had those moments where you sit in the car and there's even 10 seconds of silence is a little bit uncomfortable and you just got to turn on the radio and then maybe there's nothing even attractive enough, entertaining enough. So you flip the channel and it's painful, you know? And, and what you want is something to, to entertain you, which means to take you out of yourself. Like when you entertain a guest, you take your guest into your home. When you entertain an idea, you take an idea into your head. And when, when you're being entertained, you're being taken out of yourself and it gives you some relief, you know? Let's go watch Batman, you know? And it's a feeling of, of relief, but then the movie's over and you're back with yourself and you need to find some other thing. Uh, so it's, it's addictive. Anyway, um, so we're moving into a new story of the self, which you could call the connected self or the self of interbeingness. And living from that self, our experience of the world is very different. For the separate self, it's true that more for you is less for me because there's this external world out here and we're, and you know, if I control more of it, then, then you'll control less of it. Um, so we're all in competition with each other. Uh, that's something that our daily experience confirms when we are in the world of money because money puts us into competition with each other which is a whole other story that I'm not going to tell today, but it has to do with the way that money is created as interest-bearing debt, which puts us all into competition for never enough money. Um, so we live in a society that says, yes, that's true. The separate self is true. So you better look out for yourself. And that's what biology has told us that we do. It says, yeah, that's what you do. You, you maximize your reproductive self-interest. That's what economics says. Yeah, human nature is, that, is, is greed, maximizing financial self-interest, which basically means that you're bad. It means that you're evil by nature, according to these doctrines, according to this basic, basic myth of that says who you are. And what that means is that if you want to be good, if you want to be virtuous, then you have to conquer yourself. So we make a virtue out of willpower, self, self conquest, self discipline, um, conquering desire, conquering pleasure, uh, and set up a war against the self, which is actually the perfect mirror of our war against nature. It's the war against our inner nature. And, and even if you are a pleasure positive person and you really like, you know, you say, yeah, I don't believe that. I, I believe that we should trust desire and follow pleasure and uncover deeper and deeper levels of authentic desire. Even so, in our language, we still have all kinds of conditioning that drags us back into a war against the self. Like I heard in an earlier talk today, I just was walking by and the guy was saying, now it would be really easy just to pay your 180 euros and have your experience and then go home. But we need to co-create this event, right? I mean, it's right, like a very admirable sentiment, but what about this? It would be really easy. Like that's bad. Anything easy is bad. What's good is hard because you have to overcome yourself. So I'm just kind of pointing out how deep, how deep this story is that inhabits us. It's created our entire world. On the collective level, it's, we've been trying to conquer nature for thousands of years. 
<clears throat> Which leads me to the second central myth, central story of our Hmm. Now I'm just checking in for a moment here because um, I'm just starting to feel a little bit like a professor, you know, and, you know, I'm starting to get on with my thing, you know, and like, and it's starting to get dark and some people are lying down and I'm like, am I really talking to you or am I just kind of blathering on? So, all right, good. Thanks. See my face better? All right. Okay. Then I won't be able to see you as much, but... Oh, nice. All right. Thank you. Good people. Um, all right. So, yeah. So we also have a story of the people. Just like every culture has one. And it says, here's where we came from, and here's where we're going, and here's what it is to be a human being, and here's what's what defines humanity as opposed to other species. Our story says, once upon a time, we were naked and helpless, ignorant and superstitious, just like any other animal. But thanks to our big brains, we developed science, we developed technology, and slowly but surely, science replaced superstition, technology replaced impotent ritual, and we began to become the lords and masters of nature. We harnessed the energy of animals, and then we harnessed fossil fuels. Um, we domesticated plants and animals and turned them to human purposes and became their masters. We transcended one natural limitation after the other, broke through one frontier after the other, conquered the tallest mountains, conquered the depths of the seas. And look at everybody smirking as if we're all past this now. And it says, someday our triumph will be complete as we ascend off the earth into space. We won't even need nature anymore. We will conquer all disease. We will have robot servants to do all the work and have an age of leisure. Uh, we will um, synthesize our food. Uh, maybe we won't even die anymore. We'll have infinite lifespans, right? Thanks to the latest inventions. What's coming next? Nanotechnology, genetic engineering, onward and upward, right? So this was a very powerful myth, and we smirk at it today. Um, but one or two generations ago, it was... Very, very strong. Everybody believed it. I asked my dad one time. My dad was a, like a, a liberal, um, you know, a very rabid liberal, and he hated nuclear power and everything, you know. And he was telling me when he was a kid, the commissioner of the Atomic Energy Commission testified before Congress. Um, Strauss, his name was, and he, and he testified before Congress that atomic power would render energy too cheap to meter. It would be so cheap that you just pay like a hookup fee and you'd have infinite energy. And that was coming very soon. And I'm like, huh, well, that obviously didn't happen. What did you think, Dad, when he said that? And he said, oh, I thought that atomic power would, would be too cheap to meter. Like, everybody believed it. But today, we don't believe it anymore, do we? We don't believe that by the year 1960, we'll have energy too cheap to meter. We don't believe by the year 2000, we'll have conquered all disease. We don't believe that by the year 2004, we'll have 20-hour work weeks and 150 days off a year. But these were all things that futurists were predicting confidently very recently. Yeah. The, the, the top futurist of the 1980s was Alvin Toffler. He said, by the year 2000, the greatest problem facing society will be what to do with all our leisure time. Uh, ironically, it's actually kind of come true. It's called unemployment. <laughs> uh, 
and incarceration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which, well, incarceration is hard to think of as a good thing, but, but unemployment, you know, like, naively, like, that should be good, right? Like, not as many people have to work now. And if you don't, we can, we can supply all of society's needs without working so hard. Like, that should be good, right? If we could somehow disentangle the money system from the employment system, for example, through a basic income uh, or a social dividend, as it's called, where everybody gets uh, a certain amount of money every month, um, which we could easily implement. But um, that would require other changes that I'm not going to talk about today. Anyway, so, okay, so here we are, okay? We have a feeling that that we're living among structures and systems that are obsolete. We go, here we are, like, at, at the Boom Festival, and here, maybe some of you feel like, I don't know, does anyone feel like this, th like, here you get a glimpse of, of some aspect of how human life is supposed to be, right? And, and then the, the inner skeptic says, no, no, this is just an artificial creation. It's an excursion from reality. And you're going to go back to normal. And this is all just kind of subsidized by the destruction of the planet. And it's just like this kind of fantasy little party excursion, right? There's that cynic that says that. Uh, but I think that we can all feel that there's some aspect of how to be human that we're kind of trying to figure out here. But then we go back to normal and we no longer feel at home there. We, even before we come to these kinds of things, we don't quite feel at home. It's a world in which nobody fits, but everyone's pretending to fit and the common pretense makes us all feel alienated. Because look, everybody else seems to think it's normal. So my, my feeling of alienation, that must not be normal. I must, there must be something wrong with me. Intellectually, you might say, no, there's something wrong with the world, I'm fine. But if you're like me, there's like this, it's like this kind of child's voice that says, that says, I must be bad, I must be wrong, I must be crazy to think that the world is supposed to be far more beautiful than what's offered me as normal. I must be crazy. <sighs> so we come here and we go back again afterwards and it seems even a little less normal. It seems like even more obsolete. And, and we walk around sometimes with this feeling of, of like, you're kidding me, right? You're kidding me. I, I get that feeling in the States when I look at how ugly all the buildings are. And I'm like, right, like strip malls, you know, Walmart, you know, auto dealership, fast food restaurant. I'm like, after 6,000 years of architectural advancement, this is the best we can do. Like living in an ugly world. So our hearts know that a more beautiful world is possible. This is something we've always known ever since we were children. We, we call it youthful idealism. This knowledge that a more beautiful world is possible. But the mind doesn't believe that it's possible. The mind believes that things will always be the way they've been. Our minds need help to believe what we know. We know it, but we don't believe it. And as you've probably heard from various New Age teachers, our beliefs create our reality. When we believe that things will always be this way, when we believe that our personal actions are insignificant, because we live in a world of force and mass. When we believe that, then we act accordingly and we create a world that matches up with our beliefs. 
So that part of the New Age teachings is true. The deception there, though, is, is, is that they imply that, that you can change your beliefs through an act of will. But you cannot change your beliefs through an act of will. You can fake changing your beliefs through an act of will. But you can't actually change your beliefs like that. The way that we change our beliefs, there's a couple ways. Um, and they all involve gift of some sort. Um, generally speaking, we change our beliefs when our old beliefs don't work anymore, when the world falls apart. That could be through some kind of crisis, or it could be through some kind of miraculous experience that shows us beyond any doubt that our understanding of reality and our story of the world was too small and that a lot more was possible, that reality is a lot bigger than what we thought it was. And we call those events that show us that, well, one word for them is miracles because they were impossible from our old story of the world. Miracles are like, and I'm using the word very broadly here, right? Um, which might include psychedelic experiences, um, it might include religious experiences, near-death experiences, and, and things that just kind of happen um, in those special moments in life. And they happen more, they are more likely to happen when your world is in the process of falling apart. Because it's like, it's like living inside an eggshell, you know, that keeps everything dark a little eggshell, and then at some point, the shell begins to, to get thin and to weaken, and then cracks appear, and light shines through the cracks from a larger world. That light is what we call miracles. Something like that happens to you, and you understand that reality and possibility are much bigger than you had ever known. So, this kind of thing is happening to more and more people today because the world is falling apart for more and more people. And everything that was once so dependable and permanent seeming and solid and real is being revealed as nothing but illusion, nothing but a story that's reaching its end. So, let me tell you what I see as the new story of the people. And the new stories are born of the old stories. So the story of the connected self, of interbeingness, that's born of separation reaching its extreme. The new story of the people is born of the old story of growth and ascent and conquest reaching its extreme and falling apart. So I, I, to understand what's happening, I, I like to use metaphors from nature. Uh, so, and I, I look at humanity, and, and like many people, you know, sometimes it seems that humanity is nature's big mistake. Because you look around and, and no other species overruns the earth and grows and grows and grows and uses all all resources and destroys its environment, right? Like, why do we do that? Maybe we're humanity's, maybe, maybe we're, we're nature's mistake. And, and some people say, yeah, I mean, we deserve to be extinguished. Uh, the earth would be better off without us. Uh, but so I looked to, see, I, I never believed that actually, uh, simply because I think that, you know, looking at an ecosystem, for example, Every species has a necessary gift, necessary for the well-being of the entire ecosystem. No exceptions, which is something that humans didn't understand, or, well, indigenous people understood it, but, but modern civilized humans did not understand that until recently. You know, scientists used to think that that nature was divided into the beneficial species, the neutral species, and the harmful species, and we could improve upon nature by eliminating the harmful species, right? 
they didn't understand that that you eliminate any species and everybody is weaker. But now we're beginning to understand that. And so I think humanity has a gift too that's necessary for the well-being and the development of the entire biosphere. Thanks. But what is that gift? Well, we don't know yet. We don't know yet, but we do know that in the next phase, we need to turn all of our powers toward the healing of the damage that's been done for thousands of years of separation. So, so I look at growth, and I realize that growth isn't unnatural. Uh, immature ecosystems will grow very rapidly before reaching a steady state. Immature humans, children, grow very rapidly before reaching a steady state. They have a final growth spurt in adolescence, right? Just before you become an adult. And I think that this is what's happening to humanity. We are about to enter adulthood. And how do I know this? There's two reasons why I believe this. <clears throat> The first, and it has to do with, with two things that happen when you enter adulthood. The first thing is that you fall in love. And this love relationship is different from the love of a child to the parent, right? A child that just takes or receives from the parent. But, and then that's okay. Like, it's supposed to be like that. Like, my, my, I have three children. I'm not going to give them a bill when they turn 18 for services rendered, right? I don't, I don't want them to, to take my needs into consideration and eat less. You know, th their job is to receive, and I'm happy to give. They're kind of rightfully entitled. They feel entitled, and, and they're right to feel entitled. And, and humanity had that relationship to Earth. And again, I'm talking about mainstream civilization, okay? We, we just took and took and took from Earth. And Earth was kind of set up, almost. It's almost uncanny uh, how rich this planet was, like with all this petroleum and, and metal ores and all of these things that were here uh, to make civilization and technology possible. But today, it's obvious that there's no more room for growth. All the environmentalists are telling us, you can't, you can't grow anymore. We can't increase the amount that we're drawing from the earth and the amount that we're dumping into the environment. Um, the age of growth is obviously over. And as that happens, we're falling in love with earth. And it's different from the old love because when you begin to enter adulthood and you fall in love, you don't want to just take. You want to give, too. You want to give something to, to your sweetheart, you know? Even like a valentine or flowers, but you want to give back. You want to give and receive equally. And you want to co-create something together. You want to create together, too, maybe a family. So humanity <clears throat> is falling in love with Earth, starting as a mass consciousness starting in the 1960s, which is when the environmental movement was born. And we no longer wanted to just take from the planet. We wanted to give back too. It coincided with the um, first photos that came back from space. Probably no one in this audience, I don't know if anyone is old enough to remember the first time that these photos were sent down by the astronauts. But it was, a, it was life changing for millions of people because it was the first time they ever saw the planet without borders, without borders drawn on it. The astronauts, the astronauts had spiritual experiences. Rusty Schweikart said, from the moon, the Earth is this little blue dot that you can cover with your thumb. And I looked at it, he said, I looked at it, and I realized that everything precious to me was on this, 
on this little speck, all of music, all of art, all of history, all of love, all of death, all of birth, everybody I've ever loved, all on this little dot that I could cover with my thumb. So precious, so fragile. And he said, my relationship, the relationship changed. It was never the same again. And isn't it true that none of us under this tent simply want to take from Earth? We want to give to Earth too. But guess what? Our economic system is still built on taking from Earth. That's where the money is. If you want to get rich, pave over cut down a forest, pave it over, and build a housing development. The money's not in permaculture. The money is not in ecosystem restoration. The money is in converting nature into goods and services, and that's why none of you can find a job. It's not that you're too dumb. It's not that you're unmotivated. Well, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Some of you might have jobs, and and some of you might actually be making money doing something you love and that's meaningful and that's healing the earth. But generally speaking, that's not where the money is. So if you find yourself unemployed, maybe it's not because you haven't worked hard enough and that you were lazy and didn't compete hard enough. Maybe that is your, that's a rebellion of the soul saying, no, I'm not gonna, I can't make myself fully participate. Maybe that, rebellion wasn't conscious. Maybe it just came out as being a slacker, being lazy, being addicted, being depressed, and just somehow you just couldn't make yourself wholeheartedly go along with the program and you blamed it on yourself and everyone blamed it on you and said there was something wrong with you, but maybe all along there was something right and healthy about you and you just couldn't make yourself do it. You would rather get stoned instead. You would rather do anything but, but really devote yourself to a world that you know is wrong on some level. <clears throat> so we live among obsolete institutions that, that are not aligned with our love for earth and our desire to give as well as to receive. Okay, there's a second thing that happens in the transition to adulthood. <clears throat> and that is an ordeal, a coming of age ordeal. <clears throat> Primitive cultures knew this. So they would set up an ordeal for you to go through. They would, I don't know, take you out into the bush, tie you to a tree for three days without food or water until you had a vision, or send you off on a vision quest that you may or may not come back from, or subject you to intense physical pain, or feed you large amounts of psychedelic plants. Um, whatever it was, they would find a way to, to dissolve your identity. Your world would fall apart. Everything that seemed so permanent and so real would be revealed as nothing but illusion. And uh, do you remember that sentence? I said that already, didn't I? And that opening, that empty space, that loss of identity would open you up to take on your true identity, your adult identity, which was a larger identity that included the whole tribe and included maybe even the whole worldview of the tribe, the whole cosmology of the tribe, you would become an adult and you would come back as a full member of the tribe. None of this, like in our society where we don't have these ordeals, these coming of age initiations and so you can be 20, 25, 30, anybody for 40, 40, and still feeling like a child playing grown up, you know, like who am I fooling? You know, I'm, I've got this adult body and wearing adult clothes. And why do I feel like a child playing grown up? It's maybe because we haven't fully gone through these initiations. So 
Humanity is going through a coming of age ordeal right now. We're facing multiple crises that are making our, our world fall apart. Everything that seems so dependable and so real and so secure is being revealed as nothing but illusion. And we don't even know who we are anymore. And this ordeal is preparing us to become full members of the tribe of all life on earth. And as an adult, one definition of adulthood, an adult is somebody who applies his or her gifts toward their true purpose, as we are beginning to do as a species. Well, we haven't really begun as a species, but we see, we see glimpses of what is to come. And everything that we call holistic or alternative, you can see how all of these things are coming from a different story of the self and a different story of the people. They don't make sense. They're crazy in the old world. And if you engage in any of them, you're going to hear voices that tell you that you're crazy. But in the new world, they make sense. So for example, if, if your thing is some kind of social service, helping other people, like there's not a lot of money in that. It's kind of impractical, right? Impractical is just kind of a, uh, a lesser form of crazy. Um, but from the perspective of the connected self, it's not at all impractical because you're not separate from me. And what I do to you, I'm doing to myself as well, which is something that we can feel. It feels good to give, to help. Even if it's just, you know, someone asking you for directions and, and you tell them, yeah, you go straight. This happened in Munich. Like this guy, like we were asking for directions and this guy basically like insisted on walking the whole way with us, you know, and he wasn't getting any benefits from that. Uh, it's a completely selfless act. And if you've ever done that, you feel really good, right? Like, why should you feel good? It's because... Giving and receiving are one because we're not really separate. Okay, so um, all, all of the things that we're drawn to are, are built, are, are, they're coming from the new story of the self and the new story of the people. <clears throat> but again, our systems are still stuck in the old, which is why we feel so alienated from our systems and which is why after we come back from events like this and go to back to normal, the normal world, that's why we feel alienated. Um, so I'm actually, I have no idea how long I'm supposed to talk. Um, but just in case I'm supposed to finish soon, let me um, say a few uh, more important things, like really practical things. <clears throat> So how, I guess one practical thing would be, how do we live from the realization of connection? This is another thing that we can't actually do as an act of will. We can't stay in this, this you know, you might have a realization here. Um, you might have a psychedelic experience, um, an insight uh, that's not just a mental insight, but it goes all the way to your bones. Uh, or it might not involve psychedelics. It might just be um, just how you're interacting with people and that felt sense of what's possible. And you might have that. And then you're like, I want to hold on to this. This could change my life. I want to live from this place. But then you go back and it begins to fade and you try to hold on to it. But more and more hands are tugging at your ankles, pulling you back into the past. So what do you do about that? How do you stay? You can only do it with help, I believe, uh, which is one of my causes for optimism today is that there are more and more of us living more and more um, in these new stories. And so when we begin to doubt 
and we begin to think that we're crazy, then other people who are also inhabiting this new place can can say no. They can pull us back into the into the experience of connection and say, no, you're not crazy. This is a new logic, the logic of connection. And, and, and I'll help you believe. If you can't believe right now, I'll help you believe. And then when I am weak, when I can't believe, you'll help me believe too. And together we can inhabit this new state. <clears throat> Which is why Enlightenment is a group project. <laughs> Thich Nhat Hanh said that. He said, he said, the next Buddha will be a Sangha, a spiritual community, not just one person. Because, because one person cannot hold it all now anymore. Consciousness has grown to the point where only a group or maybe all of humanity together can embody enlightenment. Um, Matthew Fox said the same thing about the second coming of Christ. He said the first coming was in the person of Jesus. The second coming is the advent of Christ's consciousness in everybody. And how could it be otherwise from the perspective of the connected self? How could it be possible that one person is enlightened and somebody else isn't? That could only be possible in the world of separation, where I'm separate from you, therefore I can be enlightened and you're not. But in the, from the perspective of connection, you, we, every person we see is a mirror of ourselves. And, and if they're behaving in a way that's reprehensible, we can ask ourselves, oh, how is that reflecting something in me? Or how does it serve me to have this relationship? Or what thoughts and beliefs that were hidden to me are manifesting in this situation so that they come into the light of consciousness so that they can be experienced, felt, and healed. That's the, the, the approach of the connected self, uh, of non-separation. <clears throat> so we can help each other occupy this connected state and, and that's why I think that gatherings like this are so important, because we all come together and remind ourselves of what's true, of, of what we have known in our hearts our whole lives. But it was a lonely knowledge for many of us, a lonely knowledge where sometimes it felt we were the only one in the world who knew the truth, and every voice in our head doubted it. And that spark of knowledge in the center of your chest was almost extinguished, but not, never quite extinguished. It's, there's always an ember there that, that amazingly at the slightest, the slightest experience, the slightest tinder, it bursts into flame again. It bursts into hope again. It bursts into, yeah, I was right the whole time. Yeah, that experience proves it. It, was suppo it is supposed to be this way. <clears throat> So, okay, that's practical thing number one. It's not something you can do for yourself, but it's something you can do for each other. And when you give that gift to another person, then eventually it's going to come back to you too. And that gift uh, it might not be words that say, oh, we're all interconnected, so don't worry about it, right? That, that doesn't always work. In fact, it almost never works. Um, you're not here to remind me to finish soon, are you? You're just taking my picture. Okay, thanks. Um, but what works is to give people an experience that violates the laws of separation. For example, an experience of forgiveness. For example, the experience of receiving generosity. That just, because in the world of separation, that doesn't happen. In the world of separation, more for you is less for me. So if somebody gives you something, ah, they must have an agenda. Like, what's the string that's attached there? What are they actually trying to get from me? So if you act in a way that is impervious to that interpretation, that you, you can't explain away, then that doesn't fit into that person's universe.
I'm wondering whether to tell a personal story about that. Yeah? But it might be embarrassing for me. No? Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, you won't judge me. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so there I was uh, living in Taiwan. I lived there all in my 20s. And I, it, there came a point where I was really unhappy. I'd been there a few years and I was missing my culture, missing home, missing good music. Actually, I was really missing good music. Uh, and because there was, on the radio there, there was nothing but kind of like this imitation pop music. We Taiwanese singers singing imitations of Western songs that I hated to begin with. And the imitations were even, wor even worse. And so, you know, well, so one of my friends told me about, hold on, let me drink a little water here. Okay, so one of my friends said, hey, there's a uh, outdoor music concert this evening. <clears throat> Let's go. So, okay. I, I went there. It was on the banks of the Yonghe River, which was at the time a completely dead river with piles of garbage burning on both banks. Uh, the smog was so thick that it stung your eyes. And the music was just as I've described. Awful. And I was just... I was like so dejected I just I couldn't finally I couldn't take it anymore I started walking home on the concrete and then I look up and I see four angels coming toward me actually they were four guys from Seattle uh, but they were they were kind of like radiating light almost you know and they came up to me and they're like hey you're not going home already are you our, our band hasn't played yet um so, okay, I went and listened to them, and they were amazing. And, and I was just totally awestruck. They were magnificent. And I, I became friends with them. Um, and, and I really admired them, and I really wanted them to like me and to admire me as well. One of them was, um, his name was Jimmy. Um, I ended up naming my son after him, actually. And... So I wanted him to admire me and to like me. And uh, so one time I got into this conversation with him where I kind of casually dropped that I spoke fluent Chinese, you know, but did it in a way that it wasn't obviously bragging, uh, but would actually give me credit for being modest as well as speaking fluent Chinese. <laughs> and I also let slip that I made some exorbitant amount of money, way more than he could possibly make because he was only a kindergarten teacher in an English kindergarten. And, you know, I did that the same way, you know, and I was kind of playing my game, you know, and um, then all of a sudden I realized that he saw through it completely. Completely. I was transparent to him. I was naked. Uh, and I felt this withering shame begin to come up. And he looked at me and he said, with total love, he said, all right, brother. Like celebrating me, seeing through me completely into everything that I thought was ugly about myself and loving me. And that didn't fit into my universe. That was something that couldn't happen. That event was a miracle. And it told me that my universe is just going to have to change. It's just going to have to grow. This is a power that we all have. So this is practical advice number one, is to be ready to give people an experience of connection, to give people an experience of non-separation, to give people an experience of love, to give people an experience of being totally accepted for who they are. 
because our whole civilization, all of the ugliness that we see around us is built on separation. <sighs> Maybe one more thing. One way to describe the world of interbeingness is that it's the world of the gift. Gifts are what create the experience of not being separate. If I give you something, then we're connected because you want to give something to me too. If I buy something from you, we're not connected because the transaction is over. Gifts expand the self to include another person. And perhaps that's why primitive cultures saw the world through the eyes of the gift. If you ask them, why is there a planet here? Well, it was a gift by the creator. If you ask them, why did the deer why did that deer get killed by the wolves and devoured? They say, well, the deer gave itself to the wolves. They understood every species as giving something to other species. Each species had a gift to give, which is actually very similar to the way ecologists see nature. Uh, that the waste of one species is the food for the next species, and every species, like I said before, contributes something to the well-being of the whole. And we're no different. Each one of us has something necessary to contribute to the well-being of the whole. This is, again, something that we can feel within us, which is why if, you, if you're in one of those jobs where your gifts are not going towards something that they're meant for, which is the definition of adulthood, then you'll feel like, like you're not even living your own life. You're not even living your own life you'll feel, I wasn't put here on earth to do this. Or if you're unemployed, you'll, you know, like you can party for a while, you can hang out, you can travel, you can go to Thailand and live on the beach and smoke weed every day. But that gets old because as a matter of fact, our nature is not to simply maximize our security and comfort and survival. Our nature is that we want to give. It's an unstoppable desire. So my suggestion then is, thanks. Yeah, it's, isn't it obvious, right? It's an unstoppable desire. The economists have it backwards, really. They say that people would just sit around and do nothing unless they were forced to or rewarded to by money uh, because work is this bad thing. Uh, but, but that's not true. We're creative beings. We want to give, you know, and we're, we're born into gratitude because none of this that we've received have we earned. We didn't earn having a body. We didn't earn having water. We didn't make the water. We didn't earn the sun. We didn't earn the earth. We didn't earn being born. We didn't earn our breath. And we didn't earn our mothers taking care of us. All of these things we received as a gift, right? Life is a gift. That's why our basic nature is gratitude. And that's why we desire to give in turn. And, and so... You know, I think it's really time to shift our logic and our perceptions to align with this knowing of the heart that motivates that feeling like I wasn't paid on earth to do that, right? I, I have a gift to give. It's time to change our logic and to change our vision. And not only the way we see ourselves, but the way that we see other people. And you can look at every person, every person that you meet as the bearer of a gift, and curiosity, like what is the gift of this person? And how can I create an opportunity for this person to give of their gifts? That's what leadership is in the next age. Not 
wielding power, but creating opportunities for others to give their gifts. That's what a leader is. And so we can look at the world through the eyes of the gift and look at ourselves through the eyes of the gift and just try this experiment tomorrow morning. Wake up in the morning and approach your day with what am I called upon to give? And what is right to receive? Because we can't give more than we receive. That would be arrogant to think that we can give more than we receive. That would say the gifts come from me. But no, we're actually a channel of gifts. So, so, but this orientation, so orient yourself in the morning and just say, I really, I'm, I'm serious, like suggest this to yourself. In fact, right now, make a mental picture of yourself waking up at noon or whatever it's going to be and forming the intention to see, forming the intention, no, picture yourself waking up and ask it and, 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 and setting your mantra for the day. What am I called upon to give? And it's important to say, what am I called upon to give? Because it's very natural. It's a natural flow. It's not something that you force yourself into because I want to be a giver. I want to be a good person. So I'm going to enter the gift. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's very easeful. It's just simply an awareness. And, and you become sensitive to it. In certain situations, there's something you're meant to give. In others, there's something you're meant to receive. And this is a sensitivity that we can nourish and develop over time. And when we do that and step into the gift, then, see, now is the part where I tie it back to the opening of this talk, uh, which, of course, I had planned out the whole time. Um, but that is what makes us capable of the impossible. Because when you step into the flow of the gift, then synchronicities line up. Because a higher power is arranging events because you are in service to something larger than yourself. That larger thing has much more power than you do to arrange events. Our understanding of cause and effect is very limited, and it's mostly the prisoner of the worldview of separation still. But when we step into service to something larger than ourselves, that's when the synchronicities begin to happen. That's when the miracles begin to happen. And I can't tell you how many people have come to me with stories about stepping into the gift and incredible things happen. Miraculous things happen. And, and it's like the feeling is I'm not even doing anything, but it's all happening around me. It's coalescing around me. That's essential. The, the technology of being at the right place at the right time is essential to accomplish the impossible tasks that we face to change this world. The, so uh, I guess I'm offering you a kind of a prescription, not only for joy, but also for being an effective change agent and a, a miracle worker. Um, in the new age. So, yeah, so, yeah, two things. One, um, to wake up in the morning, what am I called upon to give? And, and, and just to be really sensitive to that call, not to give more than feels right, but to, to respect yourself and love yourself and and when you do that, a little magical thing happens. There'll be something, when you do that, there will be something that you would not have given the day before. But now it feels natural and easy and not a self-sacrifice to give it. And you give that thing and it expands your world because, and it brings more flow in too because the more you give, the greater the pull, because it's a channel, right? Giving and receiving have to come into balance. The more there's a pull through you that brings amazing things in as well, which gives you even more to give. And so the channel broadens. Um, and, and the um, 
quality of life, the, the, the aliveness of your life um, grows with the opening of that channel and you become capable of things that you s didn't know how to do and still don't know how to do, but they happen anyway. And the other thing is to remind each other of what's true. So that's my gift for tonight. Thank you. I have 30 minutes of Q&A, so, um, but you have, you have a message for us right now? Yeah, no. Yeah? Yeah, it should be here now. A gift from Mother Earth is here? Yeah? Mother Earth, please. Let me get a drink of water. We're going to do a short play. It takes three minutes. This is Mother Earth. I'm playing Ben Bernanke from the Federal Reserve. These are the lines. <laughs> Do you need this? Thanks, yeah. Maybe tomorrow during the day? Please. It'll be done now, that's it. <clears throat> Welcome to the Global Resource Bank Network. <clears throat> GRB converts toxic fiat money to vital echo credit. Mother Earth will tell you about it. What do you want me to do? <clears throat> Read shareholders' agreement. The shareholders' agreement, yeah. Shareholders' agreement. Okay, give me this microphone. So this is the shareholders agreement. <clears throat> Everyone owns one share in the Global Resource Bank. Shareholders value Earth's current wealth of eco product at six quadrillion eco credits that have the buying power of Federal Reserve notes. GRB converts the dollar account of everyone's asset to eco-credit. The GRB Reserve provides shareholder accounts with 40 eco-credits a day for 20 years. 500 trillion eco-credits goes to the GRB network account and 700 trillion eco-credits goes to the GRB ecosystem account. Actually, can I break in for a minute? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I just think that this isn't really the space for, it, it's like I'm not really understanding it and it's, um, yeah, like if I read that I would understand it but, yeah, yeah. you know, let's, let's um, okay. find another venue to do it. Tomorrow in the afternoon. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. We'll be back tomorrow. They just gave us the stage. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So. Um, but I'll, I'll just say that, like, I don't know the details of that, but, but many, many people are inspired to create new systems that are aligned with um, giving back to Mother Earth, giving back to the Earth. And that's probably an example of one of them. And, and, and there are many more. So um, anyway, I'd like to have questions now um, about any topic that feels at all relevant to you, to anything I said. Hello. Um, well, thank you for your time. And I would like to ask a question about uh, you say that it's important to maybe have a, a morning ritual to ask what sort of gift you can give. Is there maybe a, a nighttime ritual that you would advise to maybe kind of have a look at what gifts you have given and how that worked out? Okay. Hmm. All right. I've never had that question before. Let's see. A nighttime ritual. Well... Okay, yeah. 
I would say, I would say it would have to do with gratitude. Um, and you could, if you want to, you could look back um, over your day um, and find something that you are grateful for having received. And then identify if it's present for you. Identify a situation where you were called to give, but you did not give. And feel what, feel the, 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 there's probably a little bit of pain associated with that. I know that there is for me. Um, it's kind of like this regret and kind of this pain. Um, and if you really want to work with it in a way that's effective, do not blame yourself or try to hurt yourself as punishment for having missed an opportunity to give. But instead, give yourself just the space to feel that feeling of regret and trust that feeling and that experience to open you up. Um, that was my suggestion. Here. I, um, I can't see anybody. Oh, so hi. someone else is going to have to. Uh, On the floor. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so uh, you were talking at one point about the uh, sort of the disenfranchised and the unemployed and uh, you can smoke up for a while and you can travel for a while, but it gets old. And you were right about to say, and I have this advice for the unemployed, and then everybody started cheering. Uh, <laughs> so I, I was just wondering, I mean, for those people who know that they have a lot of love to give and they know that they have a lot of interests, but they never can seem to really focus on any one of them and they want to know, you say give the gift, and the question is, what if you don't know what that gift is? What advice would you give to find that gift? Um, that depends, the advice depends on the person. Um, one thing that happens um, is that, okay, we're, we're really highly conditioned to be alienated from our gifts, starting with school, where unless you have a gift for mathematics or something that's encouraged by school, uh, that gift is never even developed. Like if you have a gift for perceiving human energy fields, for example, or for um, communicating with animals or for growing things, right? Those gifts are not developed in school. Then after you graduate from school and enter the workforce, um, money takes the place of school curriculums and again, suppresses all but a certain number of gifts. So when you become when you can't stand it anymore and you leave that system, which is basically leaving slavery, right? Because if you're doing something to survive, that's like a gun to your head, right? Slavery, okay? So you leave that system and now you're free. But you don't know what your gifts are. And at the beginning, maybe what you really need is just to decompress, to... Uh, experience joy again, to experience timelessness again, uh, to reconnect to nature, you know, to reconnect to pleasure, whatever. Like, so that has to happen. And then you're in this empty space where you're finally free of the old world, but you haven't stepped into the new world yet. The most important thing is to trust that empty space to be as long as it needs to be. And that, to do that, you might need allies because the society says, oh my God, you've been without a job for how long? You know, two months, three months, you know? Um, there's a, there's a, a, a timing, a, a pace to this process um, that defies, defies human logic. Uh, you, you, you have to trust the process. If you don't trust the process, but you resist it, and you feel this urgency and anxiety about it, 
then you could end up getting depressed, which be, one, one kind of depression is fighting the emptiness. If you don't fight it, then it's fine, right? Uh, so that's one, one thing I would say is to trust the process uh, and to even enjoy being in that precious empty space because very soon what happens is that you encounter something that calls your gifts from you. The gifts are called by the need and the needs, of the, the needs in this world are actually attracted to the gifts that you carry. And so you'll begin to run into things that call your gifts from you. And it could be any minute now that you're plunged into a situation where your latent gifts are activated. Um, yeah, that's what I would say to a lot of people in that situation. Um, and in particular, to use the empty space to really trust pleasure and allow yourself the experience of pleasure um, and um, allow healing of shame to happen. Um, this empty space is a, is a healing space too, where the habits of separation can be healed. And shame is one of the habits of separation because shame is basically saying you're bad, right? And that's kind of built into our worldview, built into our sexuality, built into our uh, religion, right? Built into school, you know, where you have to do things you hate to be good, built into our parenting. It takes a little time sometimes to decompress from that too. Okay? Yep. Thanks. Hello, I'm Adrian. Thank you for your time. Um, you had spoken a lot about consciousness, and your last answers describe um, processes that are, uh, to me, uh, not reliving of the consciousness. As my question is simple, in, in those problems of uh, knowing what about to do. Uh, what kind of uh, gift uh, could I offer, etc. Don't you think consciousness is the wrong way to to behave? And don't you think we have to learn such like primitive, we, we call primitive people, the way to welcome what we can do without having a clear idea such like a description with word and uh, numbers, etc. of it? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, you're saying that uh, what I got from it was um, that uh, I'm, I might misunderstand um, that we should have some other approach besides um, being told with words uh, how to respond to these situations. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly what you explained about uh, what you do on in the morning. Yeah. But your your advice was to to ask yourself, what can I give today? Yeah. And to me, this is uh, the wrong advice because you will ref uh, you will have a strong reflection about it for hours and hours, and you will be never never um, glad of yourself, but because the consciousness is this this function has the property to divide things to compare some things it is useful but to behave to manage our own life to me this is the um, the wrong occidental way where we are trapping mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i mean that may be it might it it, it may, might be the wrong advice for some people um i think that 
it might be a useful transition, though. Um, but you know what? Like, don't take my word for it. You can try it out and see how it affects your your quality of life and your joy and your happiness. And if it does put you into this kind of mental state of making rules for yourself, you know, then it probably is the wrong advice. Uh, to me, it's just kind of like, um, it's like I wake up and I, I feel like I wake up and I have this moment where I choose what world I'm going to live in. I choose what I'm going to pay attention to that day. Um, so for, for me, for me, it works. Um, but yeah, like don't take my, just because I'm on the stage doesn't mean you should believe me. Um, yeah, that's my answer to that. <laughs> Hi. Oh, uh, Hi. my name is uh, Masi. I'm from Afghanistan, Where are and you? I'm here. Uh, Wait for just you. in the front, right? Uh, up, 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 up. Somebody's waving to you, right? Hi. Now. Ah, hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, I wondered, how do you see the economic system between now and ten years? Ah, finally, an easy question. Uh, things are going to get much, much, much worse before they get any better. Um, and I think in 10 years it will be unrecognizable. I think we'll have major crises in the next 10 years. Um, 10 years is a f funny time period. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I wrote a whole book about what a money system would look like that that were aligned with what's becoming sacred to us today. Uh, and I think in 10 years, we'll begin to see aspects of that happening. Um, but I think we'll, be, we'll, we'll have a lot of chaos in the next 10 years. Honestly, we'll have a lot of chaos, which will bring a lot of good things. Um, the dominance of the United States will significantly erode um, because really one of the main effects of the current money system is that it forces the entire world to finance America's wars whether they want to or not and it has to do with the fact that the dollar is the reserve currency so we can run enormous deficits enormous trade deficits and the countries that receive our dollars have no choice but ultimately but to circulate them back into the United States by buying treasury bonds. And that allows us to um, perpetrate endless war around the world. And that's something that is going to end the American empire. So that's kind of some of the good news about it. But I also see a lot of dislocation um, and in some places, uh, kind of neo-fascism, uh, pr probably in my country. Um, yeah, that's a few pieces of the picture. I think Afghanistan could be a much, much happier place because of this in 10 years. Third world countries have, their time is coming as the uh, old model of development loses its persuasiveness. You know, the, the word developing country basically says destination us, because we're developed and you're developing, so someday you'll be like us. But in the next 10 years, uh, the so-called developing countries will have the opportunity to jump past the industrialized countries into the technologies of interconnectedness. Because they're not weighed down with as much infrastructure, not, as, not like we are. So they can, for example, 
uh, in many countries, the basic farming skills that are very similar to permaculture are still alive. People still know how to do things for each other and for themselves, and they're still connected to the land, uh, and they're not all centralized yet. So whereas the United States and, and Western Europe have a lot of inertia to overcome to move toward decentralization and ecology and connection to the land, some of the other countries don't have as much um, baggage to, to do that. So anyway, there's a few random thoughts on it. Yeah, another question. Yes. Uh, sorry for my English to, to begin. I'm here. <laughs> I just wanted to answer the, the question before, because I, I'm feeling that there is a misunderstanding on what you, you said. Because, um, yes, um, I think it's not like you, your advice, your advice is to wake up in the morning and like thinking about what you can give. But it's not like a reflection as you tell me if, if I'm wrong. It's not like, a, because uh, some other people are asking you, can you give me an advice, what can I give, and blah, blah, blah. I think it's more something uh, about the state of mind. You just have to, to put the light on and to be aware of, because in your, in your day, uh, you already have done a lot of gifts, I think. And you just have to, to be aware of what you have been given <laughs> and and like this and what you received and like this I think you will give it uh, always more and receive always more maybe but I think it's it, it's it's important because um, reflection cannot uh, resolve the things yeah I mean really what all I'm thank you yeah I mean, really all I'm saying is is all I'm offering is Try waking up in the morning with the knowledge that you are here to give. That's all. And, and, and to be aware of those opportunities. But even if you just awaken with that knowledge, then you will become more aware of the opportunities. It's almost, there's almost nothing to do, actually. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Um, I just want to ask you if you think that this giving and receiving ritual can save the earth because we we live in a manip manipulated environment because of the politicians and the economics and stuff. And I was wondering if you think that this can really save the earth. Can giving and receiving save the earth? Yeah. That's kinda. basically the question. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah, um, on a deep level, I, th I would say yes. Uh, when, when we expand, because like I was saying, um, living in the consciousness of the gift enables us to do things that we couldn't do by ourselves with our own power. Um, it also gives birth to different kinds of political tactics and different kinds of activist tactics. From the perspective of force, um, the way to change somebody is either to, like, so say there's, um, you know, some corrupt government officials or something like that. Uh, from the perspective of force, or maybe a dictator, or somebody bad, right? Well, you could kill them, or force them out of office, or exert political pressure, or you could use psychological pressure. You could make them ashamed of themselves by exposing their crimes, or you could bribe them, uh, appealing to their self-interest, which is a different kind of force, you're, you're pulling on their, their you know, ego and self-interest and stuff like that, right? All force. And basically what you're saying in all of those, you're saying, I know you. You're bad. You're not, nothing's going to make you change. Those things, the, 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 the tactics of force might work 
if it's like you know some dictator and you have a superior force from the outside, or you have more money than somebody else, but the tactics of force aren't going to work on a global level um, against the power elite who have more force than we do. So there has to be some kind of change of heart. And how do we? How, how does that happen? I think General Leopard gives us a good example. Um, it happened with love. What made him feel safe to give up the world that he had been living in? What makes you feel safe to let go of something that you've been holding on to really tight and you feel afraid to let go of it? What makes me feel safe is, is when I feel totally accepted and I feel loved and it's okay. And when somebody looks at me and says, I know you, you're a good person and I know you wanna do the right thing and I'm gonna witness you doing it. So it's not that that political activist tactics are unimportant. Like I think witnessing, for example, is really important. And but it's not with the attitude of we're gonna expose you. It's we're gonna help you do the right thing. We're gonna be the ally of your conscience. Uh, I mean I always find it much easier to do the right thing when people are watching me, right? So that's just like one example. Um, Maybe I'll tell you a story. This is from a book by Andrew Harvey called The Hope. And it takes place in South Africa. A true story from the Truth and Reconciliation Committees there, where they brought together the victims of apartheid with the perpetrators. So in this one courtroom, they brought together uh, a woman who had watched her husband and her son murdered in front of her eyes by a policeman. And they brought the policeman there too, Mr. Vanderbroek, who had murdered her only family. And so they, she told her story and then the judge said, she's an elderly black woman now, living in the, in the, in the ghetto, in the township. And, and the judge said, so ma'am, what would you like to see happen to feel that justice has been done? What, what is your request? And she said, I have three requests. My first request, is that I be shown where the remains of my loved ones were discarded so that I can give them a proper burial. My second request is that Mr. Vanderbroek know that he is forgiven because, well, I'm a Christian woman and, and that's what we've been taught and that's mostly, that's what my husband would have wanted to be forgiven, for you to be forgiven. That's my second request for you to know that. And my third request, you see, she said, I, I don't have any other family, but I have so much love that I want to give. And so my third request is that Mr. Vanderbroek agree that I adopt him as my son and come visit me every month in the ghetto so that I can pour out all of the love that I have onto him. And Mr. Vanderbroek fainted in the courtroom. <laughs> and you can imagine that he was never the same man Hmm. Last question. Hi there. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to um, ask you but for me, life is, uh, I have an amazing life, but it seems a contradiction when uh, so many bad things are happening to the ecology and the, the um, 
unfairness in very rich people and the, everyone else, the 99% minus the one. So I feel that I don't do enough, or most people I know don't really do enough um, or spend enough energy on the important um, things that everyone should be thinking about in order to save our asses because, you know, we're coming, things are uh, quantumly uh, happening. So I wanted to ask you, uh, my inaction, I think, comes from a sense of uh, being overwhelmed because it seems like it's a tidal wave of, of stuff that's coming our way, chaos in a tidal wave. So my question to you is, what, what can I do to not be overwhelmed? And also, what practical advice can you give everybody here to take away on a practical daily level? What can we do? step by step what could you yeah i'd like you to comment on that thanks thank you that's a perfect question for the last thing okay so the thing to realize here is that the feeling of overwhelm comes from separation uh it comes from the belief that anything you do is insignificant from separation because you're just one little separate person right so you could you know, recycle bottles and pick up plastic and work for change your whole life. But what good does that do given the enormity of the problem, right? Um, and so first it's important to recognize that that comes from you're just a separate self in an objective universe. Therefore, nothing that you do really matters. But the connected self the inner being self of, that's not really separate from the world thinks very differently. Uh, and you understand from that perspective that everything that you do has cosmic significance, which is something that you can feel. For example, if you spend time by the bedside of your dying grandmother, and day after day you're holding her hand and singing her songs, and finally she has this big realization and forgiveness, and then she dies, okay? You can feel the significance of that act, but the mind, the separation mind might say, well, what good did that do? She was gonna die anyway. How is that gonna help global warming? Maybe if you spent that time you know, maybe you should have shoved her off into, you know, gotten rid of her and spent your time educating children. Maybe that might help, right? Um, but so, so this is an example where the mind, which is still immersed in the logic of separation, conflicts with the knowledge of the heart, which knows that that is significant. So one of my favorite sayings is by Audre Lorde. She said... The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Coming from a place of separation, we will only create more separation. The level of the revolution that we need today goes much deeper on than that. It's not just using the techniques of separation to and, and changing their direction and using them for something else. It's also a revolution in who we are and how we understand the world and what we listen to. It's, for example, you could say it's a revolution of the heart so that you choose based on what you know rather than what you believe until belief and knowledge are reunited, which is happening, but it takes time. Belief and knowledge, heart and mind are coming back into union, but they're not there yet. And in the meantime, in many situations, when in any situation where you just don't know what to do and the mind is no help, then listen to the heart and do things that feel right, that, that, that have that quality of, that I just described when you're by the bedside of a dying person or, or taking care of a lost puppy or um, you know, doing a kindness for a stranger or spending some time with a child or 
I mean, it doesn't have to be political. You know, it, it, it could just be something that's kind of giving people the experience of love, giving people the experience of, of connectedness, because our whole system is built on top of those things. Everybody has different gifts. Some people have gifts of, that are relevant for political action or social change, and other people's gifts are more personal or more family or community, you know, and are operating on a smaller level, and they're all necessary. And the only way to recognize it in this transition time is through the logic of the heart. So I guess that that's my general advice is to listen to that. Even though your mind can't explain how it's possibly going to do any good, nothing worth doing today is any good at all from the perspective of the mind of separation. It's all crazy. It's insane to, to even hope for a better world, to do anything except maximize your own safety and comfort and security. It's all insane. But if everybody does the insane thing, then we will have a completely transformed planet. So I would say um, to go out there and be unreasonable and help each other be unreasonable and give people the experience of oneness and love and generosity and forgiveness and gratitude. Thanks. Thank you, Charles, for that amazing and inspiring talk. Um, I'd just like to say that if anyone would like to learn a little bit more about how to get into your heart consciousness, please come watch my film at 12.30 here. It's called The Cosmic Giggle. Um, thank you. I think you'll enjoy it. Also, that reminds me, um, I'm also doing a workshop, leading a workshop tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Uh, I'm not sure where, but somewhere. And, and here? Okay. And we'll do, in that, we're going to do a lot more kind of more kind of hands-on, experiential kind of things where we're actually working with, um, you know, I talked about these big stories that and, and our transition from, you know, from the old to the new stories. And, and these stories project themselves onto our minds and this transition is happening in all of us. And we can, that's something we can actually work on. And so that's what we're going to do tomorrow. Um, and if you can't make it then, and but you want to learn more about my work, um, Part of the, I didn't even talk about gift economics, but, but I offer all my work as a gift online. So there's, if you go to charleseisenstein.net, you can find books, films, videos, um, my uh, first and second rap albums. Um, just joking. Yeah. Oh, yeah.